Hello everybody, it is Emery48 here, and today's video is on Star Wars The Approaching Storm by Alan Dean Foster. This novel is in the Legends timeline and takes place in 22 BBY, and it is the same year as the Holonet News promotional videos. This book I found as an ebook for $5, which is uh, one of the cheaper options. Most of them are between like 7 and 12, so not exactly that expensive anyway, but $5 was a cheaper book. Chapter 1. Shu Mei is the president of the Commerce Guild, speaking with Senator Mosul. They are discussing the planet Ancien. They want to convince Ancien to leave the Republic without using force because Ancien is involved in a lot of tangled treaties and alliances. Ancien is not individually an important planet, so the hope is the Senate will let them leave without even noticing. Their hope, then, is that many of the planets Ancien is allied with will also leave the Senate. Chapter 2. Jedi Master Luminara Unduli and her Padawan Barris Ophi were eating when a group of men began aggressively hitting on them. Luminara let them see her lightsaber hilt, and that convinced them to leave the restaurant. Luminara and Barris are on Ancien. Luminara and Barris are in Ancien's city of Supernam. They are officially there to negotiate between the city government, the unity of community, and the nomadic people, the Alwari. They do have a deeper reason to be on Ancien that the populace do not know about. The Commerce Guild is openly supporting the city government, restricting the nomadic people and infringing on their interplanetary rights. Luminara and Barris have been ambushed by more than three dozen assailants coming in waves. The first set obviously meant to tire out the Jedi. Luminara ordered Barris to scale the building to escape the onslaught. Luminara was shot and she staggered over. Obi-Wan and Anakin, who had arrived on Ancien earlier that day, came into the fight and fended off the crowd. Luminara only suffered a minor injury. The Jedi Council have sent four Jedi to Ancien to try and stop them from seceding from the Senate. That is their deeper reason for being on Ancien. They know someone is stirring the pot of this internal conflict, trying to force them to secede, likely taking their allies with them. The Jedi would like to stop this from happening, figure out who is stirring the pot, and figure out that person's motives. Chapter 3. Ogomor is Boss Ban Sorg, the Hut's Major Domo. Sorg's main base and office are in the city Supernam. Sorg had been the one to hire all the mercenaries to kill Luminara and Barris. They were not expecting Obi-Wan and Anakin to be there. Sorg has been hired to kill the Jedi by another group, which he would not name in front of Ogomor. Sorg has suggested they look off-planet and hire a more professional and efficient bounty hunter. Sorg does not want the Jedi to be successful in their negotiations. He wants Ancien to secede. Sorg reported to Shu Mei, who also had someone to report to, though she would not name them in front of Sorg. Shu Mei told Sorg he had to hire from the planet because bringing in hired hands from off Ancien would alert the Jedi Council even more. Obi-Wan, Anakin, Luminara, and Barris met with representatives in the unity of community government. The Alwari want to stay in the Republic as they are protected under some Republic laws. The city government wants to secede. There is no Alwari representation in the unity of community because the Alwari shun cities. Ranjin, one of seven representatives meeting with the Jedi, greeted them. Kanda and Talut are other representatives. The Unity feel burdened by the constant updates and mandates in Republic law. They feel the Senate have already sided with the Awari and against them. Talut does not like the Jedi. He has been working on the Force himself. He can shakily lift a cup. To prove the Jedi can do more, Luminara lifted the cup steady and dumped the water on his head. This actually convinced Talut to respect the Jedi. He said they could work with the Jedi, but not the Alwari. Another representative said that their friends have assured them aid against the Alwari if they secede from the Republic. Indurin, another representative, is intrigued by Luminar's offer of splitting some of the uninhabited prairie so the city folk can expand and the Alwari still have space to live. Indurin is, however, skeptical that the Alwari will agree to this proposal. 
The representatives seem to agree that if the proposal is agreed to, they will be inclined to stay within the Republic. Kanda is a mole. She is reporting to a mystery person about the meeting. Kanda gets paid for any information provided. Kanda met with Ogamore. She does not ever see Ogamore's face and does not know who Ogamore works for. Ogamore reported his findings to Sorg. Chapter 4. Nemrilio from Tanjay. Tamulis, a businessman on Ancien, and a female senator, and Mosul met in a bar on Coruscant to discuss their conspiracy and determine if they should trust Shumei. Mosul convinced them to continue trusting Shumei. Sorg has hired Bolgan and Kyakta to shun the Elwari. They were shunned for mental illness. Sorg believes that their mental illness will hide them in the Force from the Jedi. They have been hired to capture one of the Padawans, which would force the Jedi to negotiate with Sorg and leave Ancien without a resolution. Sorg is very confident in this plan. Ogamore, not so much. Sorg does have essentially a kill switch implanted in both Kyakta and Bolgan, in case they do not report back in time and have been captured by the Jedi. Bolgan and Kyakta kidnapped Barris when she went into a shop by herself while the rest of the Jedi continued through the market. Luminara noticed that Barris had been apart longer than usual. They went back to check the shop she had gone in and found the shopkeeper unconscious. They then decided to split up and search for Barris. They did not want to alert officials as that may worry the delegates on the Unity. Nemrilio was killed in an air car accident. Chapter 5. Barris offered to heal Bolgan's mind. He agreed to let her try. When Kyakta saw that Bolgan had been healed, he let Barris heal him as well. Now that they were both sane again, after suffering major head trauma in an accident as children, they could think clearly again. They helped her escape and are returning her to the Jedi. Barris deactivated the kill switch Sorg had implanted in their necks. Ogamore reported to Sorg that Barris, Bolgan, and Kyakta have gone missing. Sorg has put a bounty out for her capture. Chapter 6. Barris, Bolgan, and Kyakta met with Luminara. The four then met up with Obi-Wan and Anakin. The Jedi have decided Bolgan and Kyakta will be their guide to find and talk with the leader of the most powerful Alwari clan, Baroki. The group purchased Subatars. They purchased riding animals instead of speeders because of the Awari dislike of modern technology and emphasis on traditional ways. Ogamore reported to Sorg that the Jedi and their guides have left the city. Chapter 7. Anakin is battling inner demons. Obi-Wan has known about them. Luminara and Barris could sense his inner struggles. The four Jedi and two Alwari rested as night fell after their first day of travel out of Supernam. The convoy was attacked by Gerk, river predators. They began dragging Barris down the river. Anakin jumped in after Barris. Barris killed the Gerk after her. Anakin killed four Gerks after him. The other four in the group made it to shore with no trouble. Ogamore has met with one of the delegates on the Unity Council. Ogamore wants the council to vote on whether Ancien should secede before the Jedi return from their discussions with the Alwari. Chapter 8. The convoy has come upon a Yiwa campsite. They are a clan of mid-level importance among the Awari. Mazong, leader of the Yiwa, was annoyed to see two clanless riding Subatars and coming to their camp. After explaining that Bolgan and Kyakta traveled with four Jedi searching for the Baroki, Mazong invited them into the camp to talk more. Mazong has required the Jedi to be the entertainment for the banquet in order for him to give them information about the Baroki. Barris did a dance with her lightsaber that impressed the Yiwa. Anakin sang a song his mother had sung with him when he was a child. Chapter 9. All in attendance were impressed by Anakin's singing. Obi-Wan told a story that had all listeners invested in the suspenseful outcome. Luminara showed a display of the Force, levitating sand, then herself in a tunnel of spinning sand. Mazong has agreed to give them direction to the Baroki's last known campsite. After that night, the group began their journey again. After a couple of days, a flock of Kirin, an omnivorous nomadic bird, came towards them. The Kirin do not change their path if things are in their path. Instead, they eat or destroy whatever blocks their path. Bolgan estimates there are between 100 and 200 million Kirin in this flock. 
The group have found a possible shelter and are headed towards it. Chapter 10. The group hid behind rock pillars for a little over a half hour as the flock flew overhead. A couple hundred Kirin died slamming into the pillars they were hiding behind. The next day they got cleaned and relaxed. Shumei and Musul met. Shumei told Musul to remind others working with them to be patient. Mentioning impatience can be fatal. The group entered a path between a mountain and had to hide in a rock cropping as some chawicks, carnivorous poisonous plants that floated in the wind went by. Obi-Wan and Luminara want to know who has hired Sorg to stop the Jedi, as they are likely highly influential in the Sessionist movement. Chapter 11. There is an offshoot in Ancionian evolution, a shorter species that lives underground, Tukui. One of that species stole some of the Jedi's materials. Barris went after him into a cave. She was attacked by a large group of the species throwing rocks. She was able to deflect the rocks and began talking with the species about Jedi and humans, terms they have not heard. Tukui and his spoils are mostly being ignored. These people are the Gwarin. They live inside the hills because the Awari kill them when they used to live on the surface. Barris has convinced Tukui to give the food back and invited them to meet the others she is with. The Jedi taught the Gwarin many things before departing. Tukui is going to join them, although Luminara was reluctant to agree. Tukui wants to be the Jedi's pet, and Barris agreed to make sure he does not cause any issues. Chapter 12. The group has spotted a Kulun clan on the move. The Kulun are traders that roam freely and trade with both the Awari and the cities. Chief trader of the Kulun, Bayuntu, invited the group to eat and spend the night with them. Another Kulun passed a fragrance around the room the group was dining in with Bayuntu. The fragrance was a sedative and all were knocked unconscious. Chapter 13. Tukui had left during dinner and was chased before going underground. Once the Kulun that were chasing him went back to camp, he came above ground. The Kulun began packing up camp. Tukui knows something is wrong. He is going to follow the Kulun and see if he can find out if Barris and the others are still alive. The Kulun have captured the Jedi because of the bounty offered by Sorg for stalling the Jedi's return to Supernam. Tukui is following the clan. He has spotted the four Jedi and two Alwari and sees they are tied up but unharmed. Tukui threw stones at a herd of Lorqual, the largest animals of the prairie. It sent the Lorqual in a stampede toward the Kulun camp, which had set up camp at night during a thunderstorm. A couple Lorqual disturbed the Kulun camp. While chaos was going on, Tukui freed the group of Jedi and Elwari. Obi-Wan and Anakin took out a pair of guards guarding their Subatars. Luminar and Barris took out another pair of guards. The group of seven then left the Kulun camp, still in the chaos of the Lorqual, and headed for the Baroki again. Amongst the chaos, Bantu was attacked by a pack of Shan, prairie predators. Chapter 14. The group took up camp at night. The Jedi each took three-hour shifts watching guard. During Anakin's shift, he was attacked by a pair of Shan. He was not able to overcome their surprise attack. Luminara saved his life, though he was cut on the shoulder. Chapter 15. Ogomor met with the seven delegates of the Unity Council. They have set a date in the near, but not too near, future to vote on secession, whether the Jedi have returned by then or not. Ogomor is pleased with this result, as he th still thinks Bantu has control of the Jedi. The group has found the Baroki clan. They were greeted by six guards, one of them a sentinel, Bayer of the Situng Baroki. The Baroki Council of Elders have agreed that the group can stay with the Baroki, but will not talk with them until they get white wool from the neck of a syrup. The syrup are a herd of species that are kind of ram and sheep combo kept by the Baroki. Most syrup are blue or green. In their herd of thousands of syrup, there are two white wooled albino syrup. They must get wool without advanced technology or their subitar to get a meeting with the Council of Elders. There is a real danger of a massive stampede inside the enclosure if one or more of the syrups get spooked. Luminara is the one to attempt to get the wool. Rather than trying to avoid the syrups altogether, she has mounted the closest one. Chapter 16. 
Luminara ran and jumped on the top of the syrups. She quickly made it to the middle and got the wool off of one of the white syrups. On the way back, she slipped and fell. She was knocked unconscious by the fall. Obi-Wan and Anakin and Barriss entered the herd, using the force to keep the syrups away. Anakin carried Luminara back. Once out of the pen, Barriss healed Luminara. During their walk to rescue Luminara, Obi-Wan could feel Anakin's power and the force growing as the danger became more and more apparent. Shumei met with all of her co-conspirators, Eulis, Mosul, and many others. The majority have grown restless with a vocal leader of Eulis. She convinced them to wait with the Sessionist movement for a couple of days, hoping the Unity Council will vote to secede on Ancien before they bring secession to the Senate. The Baroque Council of Elders have agreed to sign the treaty. If the Jedi help them deal with their longtime rivals, another over-clan of the Alwari, the Hobbs Gol Janul. Obi-Wan agreed to the surprise of Luminara, Anakin, and Barriss. They do not understand how they are to help, as the Jedi Order cannot pick a side in an interplanetary conflict. The Jedi joined the Baroque to the Janul camp, where the battle between clans would take place. The Jedi left the Baroque line and wanted elders from both clans to discuss the treaty together. Both clans disagreed and converged on the Jedi. The four Jedi disarmed all that attacked them without injuring or killing any Alwari. After about a dozen minutes, both clans could see they were not getting anywhere with the battle, and the elders agreed to meet, building a separate building with materials from both clans, so neither was the true host of the meeting. Chapter 17. The Baroque and Janul agreed to peace with each other and the Unity Council. The next morning, the group of seven headed for Supernam. The Unity Council has decided to vote on secession at the end of the week, whether the Jedi have returned or not. Ogamor is pleased with this result. Chapter 18. The group has arrived back in Supernam. Sorg is furious. He wants Ogamor to hire anyone and stop them from speaking to the Unity Council. The innkeeper where the Jedi had been staying told them about the Unity vote taking place that evening. The Jedi headed for the municipal building immediately. No transports in sight. A couple minutes after leaving, the inn exploded. Ogamor had many snipers on the roofs of Supernam, and even more soldiers on the streets. The Jedi were battling them when a combined force of Baroque and Janul warriors attacked, both on the ground and on the roofs, clearing the roofs and clearing a path on the streets. Bayer and a combined force escorted the Jedi to the municipal building where the delegates were meeting for their vote with no further conflict or ambushes. Sorg was in the room with the delegates. There are now 12 instead of 7 delegates. Sorg has been invited to sit in on the vote as a representative of business on Ancien. However, he does not have a vote. Ogamor ran into the room with a recorder. Sorg shot and killed him, also damaging the recorder so it could not be listened to. Barriss accused Sorg of having her kidnapped and attempting to kill all the Jedi. Luminara had her calm down, as that was much less important than the treaty at the moment. The Unity Council voted 9-2 to stay within the Republic and sign the treaty with the Alwari. Shumei, Ulis, and Musul met on the 166th floor of a building on Coruscant. The number 66 seems to always mean such positive things in the Star Wars universe. Eulis wanted to move forward with secession even without Ancien voting to secede. Musul and Shumei were against this. When they could not convince Eulis to be patient, Shumei set the bridge he was standing on to fall the 166 floors. This would likely keep their other co-conspirators from being impatient as well. Shumei reported updates to Count Dooku. I'd assume she had been reporting to Sidious throughout the book, but she had actually been reporting to Dooku. That wraps up Approaching Storm. Overall, I thought this was a good book and definitely moved the overall Star Wars story forward, which I see as a very important quality. However, I had really enjoyed Outbound Flight and enjoyed that book a little more than this one. Although this book was shorter, it felt like there were more filler pages than normal. By that, I mean repetitive information and extensive scenery details, although not necessarily negative qualities in a book. This was a very easy read in terms of flow. I was able to keep reading, and it did not take me long to read the book. Another good read from Star Wars Legends. Thank you everyone so much for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful 
rest of your day.